Welcome back to the Project Censored radio show. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and I'm very glad to be joined by Dr. Margaret Flowers, who's a retired pediatrician, director of Popular Resistance, and the host of Clearing the Fog Radio. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Flowers. Oh, thank you for having me, Eleanor. So I wanted to start off with uh, with something that the Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, uh, did earlier this month, which is that they extended the federal public health emergency for COVID-19, which was set to expire on April 16th. And under this extension, federal funding flexibilities and waivers with ex expiration dates directly tied to the public health emergency are still usable. Uh, Unhelpfully, though, there are various expiration dates, uh, but they're all set to expire before or on the end of the fiscal year 2022, which is September 22nd. Now, first off, I'm curious, what kind of programs are we looking at here and how do those compare to a universal health care system? <laughs> Yeah, so the, the public health emergency basically just gave states flexibility to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. So medical practices were allowed to have more flexibility with using telemedicine. It also, um, the for Medicaid, for children who are in, don't qualify for Medicaid, but they qualify for another program that's part of Medicaid called CHIP, Children's Health Insurance Program, that you normally pay a premium for your children, they waived that premium. So that, you know, they gave more health coverage to children, you know, and other kinds of, of programs, I guess there was like more reimbursement for Medicaid patient, patients under the waiver. So some of these kinds of, you know, piecemeal things, but, you know, as usual, it's just little tweaks on the current healthcare non-system that we have. And, you know, certainly did not result in every person being able to get the health care that they need when they need it without fear of financial ruin. And so, you know, it's just, it's a far cry. It's, you know, it's the usual kind of little crumbs that get thrown out, but it's a far cry from any kind of universal coordinated system to address the pandemic. Right, yeah. Um, and it seems like it's, it, be it becomes far more convoluted and difficult to continue to do things piecemeal rather than just like one fell swoop. Um, and Absolutely. you mentioned Medicaid and, there was an op-ed in the New York Times early the, earlier in April uh, that points out that one of the provisions of the public health emergency was that states weren't allowed to kick people off of Medicaid programs. Um, and according to November 2021 numbers, as many as one in four Americans were enrolled in Medicaid. And that says a lot about the financial realities for millions of Americans, but it also suggests a grim reality once this public health emergency officially ends. Uh, some estimates say that over 15 million people could be kicked off of Medicaid. And the HHS says that they're going to give a 60-day notice, but how many people have the time or inclination to troll HHS press releases? Um, and of course, this isn't something that corporate media is talking about. Uh, so, so, Dr. Flowers, I'm curious, a lot of people feel that the end of the public health emergency is a good thing, um, but clearly that's not going to be a universal uh, feeling. Talk, uh, talk about how you see this playing out based on your professional experience as a doctor and as an advocate for universal health care. Sure. Well, first, let's talk about, you know, the Medicaid losing, you know, up to 15 million people losing their Medicaid benefits. And you're right. You know, these are people that are very low income that are already stressed that, you know, the, and the Medicaid system is not well set up to notify people about these changes. And what are their options? You know, these are people that are on Medicaid because they can't afford health insurance. And, if, and even if they get, you know, do go to the health insurance exchange and buy a plan, it's going to be one of the cheapest plans, which means that they still they're going to have to spend thousands of dollars a year if they need health care to get the care they need. So there's still major financial barriers. And this is, you know, recognizing that the majority of the population in the U.S. doesn't have more than like five hundred dollars or so on of liquid, you know, of liquidity to handle any kind of emergency. So that in itself is going to be a crisis that brings us possibly back up to the numbers of uninsured that we were seeing prior to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, you know, being put together back in 2008 after that financial crisis, and there was, you know, between 45 and 50 million people without health insurance. It was a huge crisis for the United States. As far as the pandemic, uh, 
and it, you know, I'm just astounded because <laughs> yesterday, the federal judge, uh, you know, who ruled Judge Mizell that the that the CDC didn't have the authority to impose a, a mask mandate. And on Twitter last night, it was just blowing up of all these people who literally mid flight, the attendants were announcing you can take your masks off now. And so people were very upset about this. I mean, this comes on the at a time when the Omicron variant is rising. We're seeing two new subsets of it that are even more infectious than this hyper infectious agent that we have. We're seeing a 40% increase in the number of cases in the past two weeks. But this whole pandemic has been politicized. It hasn't been about the health of the people. It's been, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's served the interests of, again, like everything in this country, the interests of the corporate state and public health and particularly the most vulnerable mean nothing. I mean, this emergency is far from over. And the people that have been hurt the most, and um, Poor People's Campaign put out a report recently on this, you know, tend to be lower income people, uh, non-white people, essential, you know, people that are that have to go out to work that don't have a have a choice. And so, how do I see this playing out? I mean, I just see that that the U.S. is going to continue to not you know, not do what's necessary to put in place the public health infrastructure, the work protections, the financial support that people need. I mean, it's amazing that the Trump administration was better <laughs> than the Biden administration. I mean, at least we got some checks from them. We got the tax credit from them. You know, we got some rental assistance, these kinds of things. Um, but, you know, under the Biden administration, all that's been ending. And, and of course, I'm sure he would have been, you know, put back the student loan payments if there hadn't been such an outcry around, you know, around ending that. So um, I just continue to see this not ending well. Um, I don't think that we're going to be prepared, even though Biden's calling some sort of a summit. I don't think we're going to be prepared for the next pandemic or even for the reality that as long as we continue to see high numbers of virus uh, proliferating, there's still more variants out there to come. You know, <laughs> we, we this whole thing has been so prolonged because of the failures of this country to do what was necessary and the weaponization and the politicization of this. Yeah, absolutely. And I I want to touch on the the Medicaid issue as well uh, versus Medicare because one of the things that or the, like the, the the name for the universal health care uh, movement is National Improved Medicare for All. And I was wondering if you could just touch on that, because some people are like, well, what, why Medicare? Why not Medicaid? And why is it improved Medicare? What is that? Uh, so I was wondering if you could just touch on that really quick. Yeah, that's really important. Um, because and I and I want to take us back to 1965, when Medicare and Medicaid were passed. And initially, the push was for creating a public health insurance that could become a universal public health insurance. You know, I've been, we've been fighting for more than 100 years in this country for a universal public health care system. But the Southern Dixiecrats, the racist Southern Dixiecrats were in charge of the relevant committees. Wilbur Mills was the main guy. And so this was part of the Southern strategy that was used by the federal government throughout the 20th century of pushing important reforms onto the states. Because if you allow the states to have a say, then you're going to have, you know, a huge variation and the racist southern states are going to exclude people. And, you know, you may get a little bit better programs in the north, uh, but, but it, it's, it's uh, Medicaid is a highly variable program because it differs from state to state and there's no kind of federal like you have to do this. So, um, so we saw, you know, after the Affordable Care Act was passed, a number of Southern states, more than a dozen of them, didn't expand their Medicaid, although they, they were given federal dollars to do that. They literally didn't have, you know, they here's the money, go expand your program. And they're like, no. So, so we don't want a Medicaid system. We don't want a national state by state system. We want a system where every single person living in the United States has the same benefits, the same access, you know, the same quality care. And that's what Medicare is. It's a national program. It's a, it's a federally funded program. 
anybody who's in Medicare, wherever you are. So this is great for seniors that, you know, may spend their winters in one place and their summers in another. They can get care wherever they are in the United States through Medicare. So, so that's what we're trying to extend. We're trying to, and actually there's very good arguments now for, for going to a full on health service and not even, I mean, Medicare would be a national health insurance, but some countries and even us with our VA system have a national health system where it's, it's a public, completely public system. Um, Medicare has also been under attack, you know, since 1965. And first there was the, uh, the effort to allow private insurers to sell Medicare insurance. So we got these Medicare Advantage plans. This is, these are, again, they sound really great, but they're a huge scam and a huge ripoff. Um, because people don't realize they're aggressively sold to seniors. Seniors don't know what they're buying. And when they actually get sick, they face all the barriers that people with private insurance have, where they can't go everywhere they want to go. They're going to have more out-of-pocket costs. They're going to get denied, uh, whereas traditional Medicare doesn't, doesn't do that. Um, that was one attack on it. Another is that Medicare doesn't provide all the benefits that we need. It doesn't cover your vision and hearing and dental and uh, you know, a lot of the things that, that people need. So we need to, and, um, you know, and it doesn't cover the pharmaceuticals, the prescriptions. So you, know, you have to buy an extra plan for that, a Part D. So, um, so we want to have a universal national health insurance or program that covers everything that's medically necessary from head to toe, no carving out body parts and saying, well, we'll cover this part of you, but not this part, as if it's like, as if they're not connected. Um, but, they, you know, just would cover everything. And that's what we're talking about with national improved Medicare for all. Great. Thank you for, for making that distinction, because I think people do, uh, people get a little confused by the by the concept of improving something that they don't think is is, is, is that great? And then why not just have a universal healthcare system, but the, the concept already exists. And I think that's important to highlight too. You mentioned the VA um, and I can't remember who, who pointed this out, but the only way that you can get socialized healthcare in this country is to agree to murder people. Exactly, uh, exactly. Right. And, the, and that's the other important thing is that Medicare already exists. Every single health professional has a Medicare provider number. We could expand this very quickly, you know, or it would be very easy to do. Yeah. Uh, again, like it seems like it'd be easier to do that than to continue to you know nitpick here and there. Um, but we're protecting the corporate interests, the profits. Right. You know? Exactly. Exactly. The follow follow the money. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted I want to talk about because uh, you're one of the co-founders of the Health Over Profit for Everyone or Hope website um, that uh, pushes for this th this system and provides a lot of various toolkits and educational resources. And I think like one of the most startling facts that's shared on the homepage there is that 80% of people who went bankrupt bankrupt in I, I don't know 2013 or so actually had health insurance. And so regardless of a public health emergency or not, there's no existing protection against, uh, you know, going bankrupt. I mean, you hear stories of people having COVID and then they, you know, they leave the hospital after a couple of days and they realize that, oh my gosh, I owe like a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there were, and there were a lot of stories coming out when COVID first hit of like going to the emergency room and coming away with a $35,000 bill, you know, not even getting hospitalized. Um, yeah. Th that study, and I think it was actually done um, in the like 2008, nine around there. And I, I know it was redone a few years later, but basically if you look at any other wealthy nation in the world, it, it, they have, some sort of universal health care program and they don't have medical bankruptcies. It doesn't exist. In the United States, medical illness is the number one cause of personal bankruptcy. And just as you said, 80% or 78, 80% of the people who went into personal bankruptcy had health insurance when they became ill. But in this country, if you become ill and you can't work, then you lose your health insurance. I mean, there's a law that says, well, you can continue to buy it through a program called COBRA, but it's prohibitively expensive. And especially for somebody who's now no longer working because they're, they're ill. It's just, you know, people so often say, well, we, don't, we can't have a universal system because that would mean rationing. And they don't realize that the United States rations healthcare in the cruelest way possible. It's not based on what your needs are, and what the capacity of the system is, it's based on how much you can pay. So how much is your life worth? 
I mean, I know stories of people who get cancer and decide not to get treatment because then they wouldn't be able to pay for their children's college. Well, nobody should have to make that kind of decision. You know, it's just, it's really sick. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I've, you know, I heard the horror stories about people uh, not wanting to get, you know, intubated or not wanting to get more extreme uh, and necessary treatment uh, for for COVID because they'd realize that they don't have the money and they're laying there. I mean, I remember personally when I went to the emergency room, uh, I I made sure that I didn't take an ambulance. I called a friend. <laughs> whose car I proceeded to bleed all over. <laughs> uh, and you know, these are, these are things that you think about that you shouldn't have to think about when you're filling a bathtub, <laughs> when you're like hovering over a bathtub, wondering how to get to a friend's car, uh, covered in blood. Um, and so, yeah. yeah, this is, these are unique. And of course, none of my friends in Sweden, where I, where I partially grew up, uh, have this, have these, you know, inner monologues <laughs> if they need to go to the emergency room. Um, and I, you, you touched upon this earlier when you, when you, when you talked about the Medicare Advantage and how nice that sounds. Um, and one of the things that we focus on at Project Censored is media literacy and understanding the way that language is used against us in order to promote ideas as beneficial when in reality they are very harmful, like right to work laws or the Department of Defense. Um, so I'm curious, like, can you name a couple of other ways that this propagandized language is used in terms of healthcare and things that people should watch out for uh, with regards to that? Well, it's literally all around us. And I think one important rule for folks to understand is basically whatever a piece of legislation is called in Congress, it does the opposite. They, they use these names that sound great. So starting with the Affordable Care Act, Affordable Care and Patient Protection you know, Act. It was none of those things. It made the care affordable for the private insurance corporations. Basically, under the, under the ACA, people are forced to purchase private insurance. I mean, this is unprecedented. And the government hired people to sell private insurance to people. Uh, the vast majority of people, over 80%, had to choose these lower cost plans that don't protect you, uh, that still leave you financially vulnerable and restrict where you can get your care and leave you, you know, liable for, for, a, for a bankruptcy. But the profits of the private insurance corporations went up dramatically because we were subsidizing to the tunes of hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And, you know, and then when they it was supposed to create this competition, but it didn't. They just carved the country up and monopolized the different sections. And then the government started floating ideas of like, oh, well, we'll give them tax credits to lure them back into the markets. We'll just give them more money to lure them back in. But people are still left with private health insurance that, that you know, they, they restricted the network so people can't go to major cancer centers, you know, the places that people need to go when they get really sick just happen to be out of network where you have to pay for yourself. So that's a big one that people need to understand. The ACA may have given some people something, but it was it's overall been a tremendous boon for the private insurance industry. And, and they're even through the ACA getting into the Medicare and Medicaid in a much bigger way. And now more than 50% of the revenue for the top insurance companies is coming directly from the government paying them. So their biggest money is just, so why are we like paying them? <laughs> why are we using that money to just cover everybody? It would be cheaper and, and much better. Um, I know you, we've talked about the public option and that whole, how that was used in 2009, 2010 to convince liberals that you couldn't have a national improved Medicare for all. It just wasn't gonna happen. It wasn't politically feasible, but we'll give you this public option, this choice of a public insurance. But again, you know, that's been done over and over again, and, and it doesn't work. It, you can't compete. A public program can't compete with these insurance companies. They've got the marketing down. They've got it all, you know, under control. And they don't, you know, they're always 10 steps ahead, no matter what rule you make. So, I mean, that was a big one in the ACA was there was all this clamor about covering people with pre-existing conditions. So the insurance company said, yeah, we'll cover pre-existing conditions, but we're going to create ultra narrow networks that limit where you can go to get your care. Um, another big one has been the what are called consumer directed health plans. This is a big, uh, I don't know, a big one, I think, because even like people I know that have been studying public health are sold by the idea of a consumer directed health plan. And these are the ones that have the high deductibles and the high co-pays and are supposed to allow you to have control over you know, your care. But again, you, you know, you don't. Um, 
One of the newer ones is what's called account accountable care organizations. And that sounds really great. Like, don't we all want our care to be accountable? And it's like that, the, it's the iterations. There was the health maintenance organization in the 1970s and, you know, the HMOs. And then, then it was the managed care organizations. And now it's the accountable care. And they're just iterations of the same thing. But basically accountable care means that the physicians are accountable now. Like they're the ones assuming the risk, not the health insurance companies. The whole insurance is that you pool the money into a big pool and then it's there for people when they need it. But that's not how it works in the United States. And basically what the accountable care organizations do is physicians have like a certain amount of money to spend on their patients. And if they're spending more than that on a patient, then they actually like, they'll make more money if they spend less money on care for their patients. So, uh, and so it, and it also incentivizes physicians to drop patients who aren't improving or who maybe are needing more care, you know, cause then it's eating into their direct, direct income. So it's, it's, and this whole, also this like idea of values-based medicine, it's the same kind of thing. It's the, you know, what we want is health professionals in this country to be able to use their training and their knowledge and their experience to provide patients with the best care that, you know, the care that they need. And, and what we do instead is their physicians in this country they have to basically lie, cheat, and steal to get their patients the care that they need. And, and it's, you can't write certain things in the chart because then maybe the care won't be you know, paid for. So that means that your colleague comes along and there's important information missing from the chart because you're afraid to put it in there because it might hurt your patient. I mean, it's just, it's so it has undermined and degraded the profession of medicine in this country. I don't think people even realize. And that's why the burnout rates are so high for physicians in this country too. And, and there's all these now wellness and you know stress reduction programs for, for our health professionals. The biggest stress reduction program would be a national health system, you know? But you know, anyway, so yeah, so um, the values based is another, it's another punitive measure to control, you know, health professionals, accountable care, any of those types of things. And then the newest one is um, the direct contracting entities which is pri fully privatizing Medicare. So we had the Medicare Advantage scams. Uh, now hedge fund owners are just basically buying up these like, uh, they're contracting directly with these health professionals. And then any of your patients are in now this private plan under this private contract, even if they didn't choose it. Choose it. And most of them don't even know it's happening. And so they may have traditional original public Medicare, then all of a sudden they're in this whole thing that they didn't realize they were going to be part of. So it's just, um, we're red heading in the really wrong direction right now in this country, sadly, during a pandemic, you know, to boot. Yeah. And I think, uh, I believe it was Open Secrets, uh, which is a great website folks should check out. You can very well, you very can useful. follow the money very well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think uh, Biden has gotten more money from big pharma than any other um candidate for president and before uh, him obama obama you know from right. health insurance companies and pharma yep yeah who basically wrote the aca as i understand it. <laughs> basically <laughs> like it was written for them right. um yeah and it, i mean it's so it's so bananas that uh you know your health professionals basically then aren't the ones who get to make decisions about your care it's some it's some insurance person who doesn't have the professional schooling to know what's best for you uh, and, you know, I mean, the, the, there are so many stories uh, that it's uh, like I had a friend who needed uh, neck surgery, but wasn't able to get the surgery that she needed because her insurance wouldn't pay for it. So now she got, you know, worse neck surgery that's going to require possibly another surgery just because her insurance refused to pay for the surgery that was actually necessary. I mean, right. And, and, to, and then on the flip side, to understand what it's like in a country that actually has a healthcare system. A friend of mine was in Australia, his son lived in Australia, got cancer, went to the doctor. They, they suggested a certain procedure and then it went into the system for review and the system came back and said, no, we wanna do this different procedure. It's more expensive, but it has a better outcome. So you're gonna do better if we do this. Like they literally, <laughs> the system said, we wanna give you a better service than what you were asking for. Like, and you know, and like in France, I have a friend who, who uh, 
practices in France. And it's like, to me, it's like a dream come true. If he has an unusual patient and he needs to do some, you know, kind of unique type of uh, treatment for that patient, he submits it to the system and other physicians in his field look at that and discuss it with him to decide if that makes sense or maybe I would try this, you know, like it's literally like putting the, the brains together and deciding what's best for the patient, the whole thing. It's like, this is, you know, health over profit. That's why we call our, our campaign health over profit because here it's profit over health, but it's not that way in most of the rest of the world. Yeah, uh, it, uh, it, is, it is truly remarkable. Um, and, you know, just to, to kind of be the, the Debbie Downer of the, the whole situation here, I know that, you know, when, uh, when the pandemic was starting, there was, you know, a force the vote attempt to try and get something like this passed. And it seemed like, well, what an ideal time to, to push for universal health care during a global pandemic. And it didn't happen. Uh, so I'm curious, like, where do you feel that this fight is right now? And if we couldn't get it in the midst of a global pandemic public health emergency, uh, what do you feel that the, the chances are? Like, where are we at the, where, where are we at this juncture? Um, so we're, as you well know, and, and talk about living in a country that's a plutocracy. I mean, it's the, the government is designed and operates to serve the interests of the wealthy. And when are we gonna get affordable housing? When are we gonna get affordable education? When are we gonna get you know, worker protections and decent wages in this country and pensions, you know, a decent, like a, a non-poverty social security <laughs> would be nice, you know, for folks. All of these things are connected. All of them face the same barriers. And we're gonna win these things when we organize and create the situation where the government feels like they have to adopt this if they wanna continue to exist, right? Other countries have done this. You know, they've gone from, you know, Canada. Canada had a very privatized system before they went to a public system. And the, and, the, and the doctors were against it. The doctors went on strike up there. You know, they had to bring in docs from outside the country to provide the care. And now they love it. You know, <laughs> they're not coming down here. <laughs> they're, they're coming down here to learn. Literally, I, I had a friend who worked in a medical school in, at, uh, in Toronto and said that they would have residents come down to the US to do training because they would see progression of illnesses down here that they don't see up in Canada, yeah. right? It's like coming to a third world country, right? So, uh, so where are we? I mean, I think that what was sad about force the vote because I agreed with it 100%. You know, Biden was just coming into office being inaugurated and this was the time to show whether these progressives in Congress were gonna stand up to him or not. Were they gonna represent the people or not? And they sided with not, you know, and they, and, they, and they mocked the force to vote people. And then some of the established organizations that have been working for national health insurance sided with them. They gave them the cover to do it. I mean, we saw this, we've seen this before in other movements and, and, and other issues. So what I'm excited about is seeing that continued effort and seeing people coming into this fight that are not part of the established groups and who have the, the courage and the dedication to continue to fight for this. And I think, and also I think what's important is that over the years, I've seen more and more kind of groups that aren't focused on healthcare, you know, workers groups and race, anti-racist groups and poverty groups, understand that this is part of the agenda, that, that a national health system is part of the agenda. And so I think that the, they make it part of their issues, they educate about it, there's alternative parties that educate about this. So all of this is growing, but, but we need to do more. And I mean, we need to, like the climate activists who just get out there and you know get in people's faces and, and make this a huge issue and, and are bold in their activism, that's what needs to be done. And that's, you know, in 2009, 2010, when the, uh, when the Affordable Care Act was going through Congress, we had this same fight where some of the established groups were kind of tempering themselves be, so that they wouldn't make the Democrats look bad. And there was a small group of us, and it actually wasn't small because when we, you know, put out the call of who would risk getting arrested to fight for single payer healthcare, 
over a thousand people signed up and we did actions across the country hundreds of people getting arrested we were doing actions in congress we were disrupting hearings uh, we were getting into the media going where the media was because they weren't going to come to us so we would you know jump in there <laughs> where they were and we actually almost got a piece of uh, a single payer bill to the floor of the house and we did get one to the floor of the senate uh, for three hours it got pulled after that but that was the first time in the history of the u.s that single payer was was introduced on the floor of either body so that's to say that if you have a small group of people and, you, and we didn't have a lot of resources we stressed out over buying a banner you know but you know but we were just focused on that and paying attention to what was going on and where were the opportunities and getting in there just as a lot of the climate justice people are doing and, and that's what we need to be doing and and you know, and and understanding that our issues connected to these other issues and those issues are connected to our issue. And if we all fight together, it's going to happen. But it's it's system change. You know, It's not going to happen under capitalism. So we just have to keep fighting and educating ourselves. And this is the time to be doing it with the pandemic. You know, yeah, it's just exposing everything. And it's and 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 the fact that we're living in a failed state you know understanding that the role of a government is to provide for the basic needs of its people and the united states is failing to do that on every front you know they dropped they dropped all the covid funding in the most recent bill but they increased the funding for the pentagon and suddenly biden you know last week another 800 million of weapons going to continue violence and death in ukraine yeah yeah. Sorry, I'm not very, I'm not very. <laughs> no, I think it's, I think it's so important to, to make these connections because I think oftentimes we just get, and, 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 and I think it happens to the best of us, right? We're like, we're really focused on this one issue and we really want to get this through. And so we end up in this, you know, kind of echo, echo chamber of our own silo, silo. where it's just this one issue. It's just this. And we don't, we, we, we start to lose the plot in terms of how this is connected under the same system and how we really can only affect change on our issue that we care the most about if we collaborate and if we recognize the larger umbrella uh, of rot that we are that we are all living under together. So I think that that's an important thing to uh, to highlight for sure. Well, those those silos are intentional. That was that was manufactured and. It's the way that the that the nonprofit funding goes and getting people fighting over these little crumbs, you know, and 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 I mean, and and the whole kind of the liberal class and and and, and how people get into this. Like, I remember, I, you know, I, you may remember I got COVID right at the beginning because we were at a conference in in Queens and had to stay an extra week and for a family emergency. And that was before we knew that Queens was where COVID was. And I came back home and I got sick. And I called the health department to see if I could get tested. And they're like, no, 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 you don't fit the criteria. And I'm like, but I've got all the symptoms. I know this is what it is. I've been out and about. I feel like I should like let these folks know. And they wouldn't test. And I finally, after talking to three people in the health department, I said, they're like, well, no, the rules say, you know, I'm like, do you feel good about this? Like, you know, as a public health expert, that this is what we should be doing, right? But because the rule says this, I was like, when are you going to like understand that the rules are not written for public health? You know, this is what people have to recognize. You got to, you know, you got to care more than about what you're presented with. You got to make, you know, does that make sense? Should I be, com you know, complicit with this or not? And for me, I just couldn't be complicit with the system that we have. So, and we always look for campaigns that try to connect folks across issues because that's, super important and a lot more people are doing that and, and that's that's how we win. I see a lot of positive signs. Sadly, it's not gonna happen tomorrow, but and, but you never know. You never know what that trigger is gonna be when you know things take off. Yeah. And so we just gotta keep fighting every day. Absolutely. As if the next day could be that day, right? <laughs> <laughs> Stranger things have happened. Right. Um, well, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, let folks know where they can uh, read more about this issue, but also follow the the work that you do, uh, not least of all connecting all of these issues. Thank you. Well, I mean, my work, as you mentioned, I'm the popularresistance.org. I encourage people to folk, to sign up for the free daily digest. That way every morning 
We get summaries of the articles posted the day before. Uh, Clearing the Fog Radio is also a podcast, so people can subscribe to that on the various podcast platforms and also find it at popularresistance.org. Um, the Health Over Profit for Everyone campaign has some resources, but I think another good resource is actually, and I'm on the advisor to the board, full disclosure, um, is Physicians for National Health Program. They have a lot of uh, resources as well, and they post articles daily to keep you up to date about what's happening with healthcare. And, and then there's you know lots of great efforts out there. The the you know the red berets the medicare for all the there's a national single payer group um, there's a lot of local you know groups in the states that folks could could turn to but again we've got to be focused on national improved medicare for all we don't want a southern strategy we don't want an unequal state based system Right. Yeah. I think that's an important note as well. Uh, well, thank you so much for taking the time again and, um, onwards and upwards as they say. Great. Thanks for all you do.